<laughs> Next speaker is uh, Leo Kongu from uh, the Technion. Uh, Leo did also his PhD there, right? Yes. Yeah. He's from uh, electrical engineering. Uh, Leo. Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for the uh, great opportunity to present uh, our results, uh, especially in front of the people who really uh, established the field. Um, so uh, I very recently arrived at the, to the Technion about a month ago, and I'm setting up a lab. So in the meanwhile, I'll be showing uh, some results from the postdoc uh, done in the group of uh, Charles Ann and Fred Walker. I had the laser pointer. Leo. Uh, it was done in the group of uh, Professor uh, Charles Ann and Dr. Fred Walker. And uh, today I'd like to uh, uh, bring some more practical aspects of uh, two decks, and namely how we can combine them with conventional semiconductors. Great. Uh, I'll begin with a very brief introduction. I will motivate the problem. Uh, and then I'll present some of our results, the challenges, and how we uh, um, uh, tackle them with growing these materials on silicon. Uh, I'll present a very brief uh, taste of a potential application, and if time permits, uh, uh, on the merits of the chairperson, uh, I will show some uh, uh, recent data on two digs on gallium arsenide. Now, after the wonderful uh, morning session, I'm sure uh, oxide two digs need little introduction. Uh, to me, this is very interesting because it's still at the point where basic physics uh, uh, attracts a lot of interest, like we saw in the morning uh, session. Uh, but also, there is the onset of some applications, of some devices. Mostly, I think the earliest one was uh, maybe 2012. Okay? But there is a growing uh, uh, interest in the potential applications of these um, uh, two digs. And uh, the key feature that is of interest here is the uh, very high density of electrons, uh, which starts at 10 to the 13 for the famous uh, LAO-STO uh, system. And as uh, Jean-Marc um, uh, uh, wonderfully introduced, uh, after the discovery of that by Otomo and Wang, uh, this has been observed in dozens of other material systems. And a very famous one uh, is the uh, rare earth titanates. Uh, uh, which are uh, RTO, STO, and uh, probably the most uh, well-studied uh, system is the gadolinium titanate, or GTO, which was pioneered by the group of uh, Suzanne Stemmer at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, one of the nice features of this uh, system is that this actually shows the uh, uh, carrier density of uh, 3, 10 to the 14 electrons per centimeter square per interface as predicted by the polar catastrophe model. It's also interesting uh, practically because it's more carriers, so we can make uh, potentially better devices out of this. Um, so some applications, and this is uh, really all that I could fit into one slide. So uh, these four works, uh, this is from the Huang group, this is from the Rajang group at Ohio State, these two are from uh, Manhart group in Germany. Uh, these show uh, nice uh, transistors or field effect uh, devices that show really nice transistor characteristics. Uh, this particular uh, work is the only one done with uh, GTO and it shows unprecedented amount of charge modulation of 10 to the 14 electrons per centimeter square modulated by the field effect, which could be useful for various types of uh, devices. Here we see a ring oscillator, uh, which is an actual circuit uh, that was done by, again, the Manhart group. And I didn't have room, but uh, people do um, UV uh, detectors and chemical sensors and uh, all kinds of spintronic devices and all kinds of other exciting uh, exciting devices that could be uh, potentially very interesting for technology. But there are a few limitations. So the reason we're interested uh, uh, in oxide 2 decks for transistors is because they have a high carrier density. And we want the transistor channel in the on state to be very conductive. Conductivity is a product, is a, a product of uh, the carrier density and the mobility. And while we have great carrier densities here, the mobility is between 5 and 10 at room temperature on a good day, if you grow your samples right. Uh, 
And this uh, provided the key motivation for us to integrate these structures with silicon. Because if we could somehow convince the electrons, even part of these electrons, to go into the silicon surface, okay, we could enjoy both the high carrier density of the oxide 2 DEGs and the high mobility of the semiconductor, which is, uh, in the case of silicon, 1500. So we get two orders of magnitude improvement versus the oxide channels. Moreover, all these great devices were fabricated on the tiny, if you ever worked in such a lab, you would know, on a tiny uh, commercial ceramic substrate, which are typically five by five millimeters. If you spend a lot of money, you can get 10 by 10 millimeters, but not uh, much more than that. And the entire um, development of the microelectronics industry and Moore's law and everything that made this projector and all of our modern lives depends on uh, what we call scalability. The ability to uh, produce many devices, many chips on one wafer. And today in the industry, we use uh, 12 inch or larger silicon wafers. Uh, so we can mass produce them and reduce the cost. Okay? You cannot do that with this, but you can do that with silicon. And uh, one last um, hurdle with using these devices on ceramic substrates is their uh, very low thermal conductivity. In the, our daily lives, we use ceramics uh, as uh, heat insulators, right? Uh, so again, if we could integrate these oxide 2 decks on silicon, we can uh, maybe uh, couple the electrons to the semiconductor. I'm saying silicon, but this pertains to all uh, semiconductors. <clears throat> Uh, we could have a more uh, scalable solution. The growth of uh, um, some oxide has been demonstrated on 8-inch wafers, and there's no uh, um, fundamental limit to grow it on even larger wafers. And silicon offers an order of magnitude higher uh, thermal conductivity <coughs> compared with other devices, which is important for high power devices, uh, high current density devices, and high frequency devices also important for technology. So uh, I hope I convince you that we want to uh, grow these uh, structures on silicon. Now the question is how to do that. And this is not so easy. Uh, the growth of STO on silicon was pioneered by uh, Walker and co-workers almost 20 years ago. It took them quite a bit of work. And uh, this is a thermodynamic uh, battle of titans over the oxide between, sorry, over the oxygen between the oxide and the silicon. And this isn't uh, very accurate, because if I talk about thermodynamics, uh, there is no battle. The silicon would win. But uh, we can look kinetically and find metastable approaches to stabilize the oxide on the silicon. But again, I would not dive into the full details, but this is a very challenging uh, growth scheme. Because if we uh, use too much oxygen, then we will form a silicon oxide on the surface, which is amorphous, which would inhibit uh, any uh, epitaxial crystalline growth on top. On the other hand, if we don't supply enough oxygen, then we don't really form an oxide. Uh, and then uh, the silicon readily reacts with the metal constituents of the oxide, forming silicides, which again hamper the crystalline quality uh, and uh, the electronic properties. So how we tackle, and there are many other uh, challenges revolving that, we tackle them using uh, MBE, or molecular beam epitaxy. Currently, the only growth uh, technique uh, that enables to tackle this challenge, okay? And uh, MBE is a, a fancy name and a very expensive instrument, but uh, its function is very simple. All it does is thermal evaporation of metal sources. Here is a top-down view, I don't know if you can see, to a hot titanium effusion cell at 1600C. Okay? And we also heat the substrate to give the impinging atom some kinetic energy. This is a two-inch silicon wafer uh, at 950C. Uh, and uh, as uh, Jean-Marc also um, mentioned in the morning talk, we have an in-situ characterization technique of high energy electron diffraction, which gives us um, very sensitive information about the first couple of monolayers on the surface. And this is called read. <clears throat> So I will not dive into the details, uh, but I, I'm trying to convince you that this is a very delicate multi-step uh, process. Uh, we desorb the native oxide in UHV in ultra-high vacuum, which uh, we can see the diffuse scattering by the amorphous oxide uh, is reduced. We see some surface reconstruction. And then in a very measured and slow fashion, we monitor the surface reconstruction as we drip a bit more and a bit more of uh, strontium. And we're talking about a, a percents of a monolayer accuracy that we need to obtain here. And after about, uh, I don't know, 10 steps here, 
uh, where we gradually add more strontium, more titanium, a tiny bit more oxygen, uh, not to oxidize the silicon, but to provide enough oxygen. We're left with two and a half monolayers of amorphous, completely amorphous strontium titanate on silicon. And then the magic happens. We heat this up at ultra high vacuum. All, sorry, all done in the chamber. Um, we heat that up in ultra high vacuum to about six, 650 uh, degrees centigrade. And uh, within a few seconds, we see everything crystallize, crystallizes. Uh, these uh, um, nice uh, continuous uh, smooth streaks indicate single crystal and smooth uh, surface of two and a half unit cells of STO. On top of that, we can use more conventional MBE approaches such as co-deposition to grow more STO or the other oxides that uh, we're interested at. And uh, as I said, we're interested in integrating uh, rare earth titanates onto silicon. <coughs> so we grew the following structures. We used the template layer of STO and silicon. On top of that, we deposited a thicker layer of both lanthanum titanate, LTO, and gadolinium titanate, GTO. And not to, uh, so we don't have to worry about surface uh, reaction. Some of these rare earths are reactive to the moisture in the air. We capped it with a thicker layer of uh, <laughs> strontium titanate, and these are electron diffraction patterns on uh, the top of the RTO layers and on the from the top of the top STO layers. Now, nobody has ever grown these structures before, so we had to be very meticulous about characterizing everything about them, because uh, given all the constraints imposed by the semiconductor substrate, we, uh, <coughs> we're not in the uh, process uh, region where we could grow the best quality films. Ideally, we would want to grow at a much higher temperatures, being closer to the uh, equilibrium or metastable uh, state, uh, but we can't go there because then the films would react with the silicon. So we have to be very meticulous about the structure and the electronic properties of them. And these are, I would not dive into the details, but please feel free to stop me and ask. Uh, <clears throat> These are x-ray diffraction uh, of the, both the LTO, STO, and the GTO, STO, showing a single crystalline and the high crystalline quality uh, features. Single crystalline is this then? Sorry? Single crystalline is this then? This is a pretty broad peak. Uh, this is a two theta peak. Uh, the rocking curves we observe uh, are typically a few tenths of a degree. Okay. So do you have microcrystallites, or is it really a single I mean, I cannot say that the entire two-inch wafer is uh, one crystal. I don't think anybody uh, can say that, but, uh, you sorry? In semiconductors, you can. Uh, yes, in semiconductor, you can. But you're much closer to equilibrium in your growth conditions there. And here, if I uh, go to the uh, supply enough energy for the oxide to feel comfortable, then the interface with the silicon would feel uncomfortable, OK? Uh, and just to exemplify uh, this point, this is a TM image. Uh, I'm afraid it doesn't show well in the projector, but uh, I'd like to point your um, Can you see anything? I'd like to point your attention. Can you see the points here? It's not a very good uh, TM uh, uh, micrograph. Uh, I took it. Um, I, I claim responsibility. Uh, so, but you can see that the interface is atomically abrupt, okay? And this is the essence of uh, our effort and my last uh, five minutes of the talk to preserve this. If we ever want to couple the electronic structure of the oxide with the semiconductor effectively, we have to have this atomically abrupt interface. And this is why we have to uh, go through all this length, both to uh, be careful uh, when we grow and to uh, characterize what we obtain. Okay. We can also see that uh, in uh, X-ray reflectivity and other meth methods that I will not show here. So uh, again, uh, uh, people have uh, demonstrated that these structures have 2D electron gases, but since uh, um, we grew them at challenging circumstances, we also wanted to make sure that we have the right electronic structure. And to do that, uh, for both systems, we, uh, did, we used a systematic approach where we varied the thickness of the RTO layer and we varied the number of interfaces. And again, uh, if you want, I can dive into the details. Five minutes? Three minutes? Three. Let's make it five. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're able to pinpoint the uh, conductivity to the interface. Okay, and we also uh, see a, an order of magnitude difference between uh, the LTO STO and the GTO STO system. <clears throat> I will not dive into the details, but we uh, attribute this to uh, interface localized oxygen vacancies. 
that donate electrons at the interface here and uh, they exist with LTO because we have to grow the LTO at a lower oxygen pressure otherwise it grows on a different phase which is not epitaxial. Uh, given the time constraints, I will skip this part, but I will just give the conclusion of this paper uh, done in collaboration with the Rajan group at Ohio State. Uh, and here we demonstrated that using uh, silicon as the substrate uh, uh, helps dissipate the heat at high current density. And we observe non-saturating current, this is the instrumental limit, non-saturating currents uh, uh, at above 10 amps per centimeter. Okay? These are huge current densities. Uh, that are made possible because of the uh, high current, high carrier densities. And we also saw, uh, see that the drift velocity uh, does not saturate. This is again the um, instrumental limit. And this is because we can mitigate the joule heating uh, 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 caused by these high currents by the high thermal conductivity of the substrate. And when we do the same uh, uh, measurement on a ceramic substrate, which is what most other groups do, the uh, drift velocity saturates about here. Okay? One last point I would like to make. Uh, as I did not mention, we were not able yet to get the uh, electrons into the silicon. And one of the approaches uh, uh, we considered was, um, first we took a look at the interface and we measure a barrier for electrons between the STO and the silicon. So we, uh, one of our approaches to uh, address that is engineer, questions? is engineer the bands in the semiconductor. And what if we could uh, lower the conduction band to be aligned to the STO or even below that? And thankfully, there is an easy uh, semiconductor system to do that. And that's a very well established uh, three fives. And this is a very uh, famous example of indium gallium arsenide where you could uh, tune the band structure with uh, uh, alloying uh, uh, indium. And just to test the feasibility of this concept, we took a look at the end member, just gallium arsenide. And uh, here again, we had some uh, completely different but considerably challenging uh, aspects uh, of the material uh, growth here. And this is where I collaborated with the Larry Lee group at Yale that grew uh, a homo epitaxial gallium arsenide for us and capped it with arsenic. I will not go into the details. The bottom line is that we were able to grow these structures successfully, also on gallium arsenide, and we measured the carrier densities that we would expect here. Uh, I will leave you to make the time, uh, to make the time deadline. I will leave you to read the uh, conclusions by yourself, but I would shamelessly use this uh, uh, stage to uh, invite uh, excellent uh, potential graduate students and postdocs uh, to uh, email me and discuss opportunities in the group that I'm setting up at the Technion. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Leo. Uh, question? Yeah. Uh, the whole motivation here is that you have this high electron density at these interfaces, but these interfaces are not on the silicon. They're away from the silicon. What makes you think you can get those electrons from those interfaces into the silicon through whatever it is that you have between the interface and the silicon. That is an excellent point. How can we convince the electrons to go into the semiconductor? So uh, first, uh, they're not, uh, as uh, uh, Jean-Marc showed, and uh, we also have a schrodinger person simulation to support that, they're not localized at one atomic layer. Okay? And in these uh, structures that I've uh, shown, there were two nanometers from the silicon. So uh, the uh, Schrodinger Poisson simulation uh, predicts some spillage of the electrons into the silicon. Okay? Uh, now it is a challenge of band structure engineering at the uh, silicon uh, STO uh, interface to uh, form the right dipoles to push some. We don't even need the whole electrons. It's enough if we get 5%. Okay? That would be a tremendous improvement. So uh, we're working on an ongoing work, which I cannot reveal uh, too many details, is to engineer dipoles at that interface. We have two different approaches for that. And again, the other work uh, that is ongoing is to uh, alloy 3-5 semiconductors to tune the band structure there to have a negative uh, band offset between the STO and the semiconductor. Just as a comment, the latter seems very interesting because that group of materials um, is where one is looking at now for high power devices and high frequency devices. So yes. the coupling of the two 
which seem to be very promising. Not only that, but uh, these oxides are also high K dielectrics, which is great for uh, the gate dielectric uh, later. In line with this question, I was wondering if you can use a gate to try to convince these electrons to move down uh, this is a tricky aspect because I also want to use this gate to uh, turn the channel on and off later. So yeah, th that's definitely something that we consider either as a top gate or as a bottom gate like uh, you guys do. So what is the mobility that you get of these uh, two days? So uh, uh, I will be honest and say again, we're far from the ideal growth condi conditions of these structures. So uh, in the STO we get a mobility of about one. Uh, centimeter square per volt second, where uh, uh, groups like uh, um, Jean Max that go uh, much higher quality films because they can grow on ceramic substrates that don't react with the oxide, uh, they get uh, 10 at room temperature, about 10, 15. Yeah. yeah. But that's not what you want. You want to get it. Yeah. So I want a thousand. Okay. And by the way, if I go to three fives, I can get even almost 10,000. Okay. Uh, it's all n never uh, the bulk mobility by the surface, but again, we're talking about hundreds. In terms of the silicon oxide. Uh, so we have a work uh, with another oxide on germanium, and we showed that uh, actually the electronic structure of the interface is incredi incredibly clean because of the uh, atomically abrupt interface and the absence of any uh, oxides. Mm -hmm. What's the direction of the silicon? Uh, this is uh, zero, zero, 001. Yeah, on 111 silicon, there are uh, much easier methods to grow with uh, YSZ, and uh, yeah, you can do that with PLD. Okay, so let's thank you all again.